One of the biggest mysteries to shock the world happened on February 1st, 1895. Little Landy Junkins disappeared from Burgoo, West Virginia. The 10-year-old girl had been sent at her mother's behest early one Friday afternoon to call upon their neighbor, a Mrs. Warnick. Warnick had been sick recently, so her mother felt it would be a kind gesture to check on her. Even though the trip was long, about a mile and a half, Landy's mother felt certain she would be just fine. A concern began setting in that evening in the Junkins' household. Our five o'clock rolled around and there was still no sign of the little girl. Landy's mother dispatched her husband to the Warnick's cabin, but upon his arrival, he discovered that his daughter had never reached her destination. Landy's father and the Warnicks mounted a search for the girl, but soon night fell, and everyone was forced to abandon their efforts. Upon reaching home, Landy's father eventually discovered her trackway in the snow. He followed it back in the direction of the Warnick cabin for about a mile until they abruptly ended in the middle of a fallow buckwheat field. There were footprints tramping round and round as if she had spun about in confusion, but no trackway leading out of the wide open space. All around were yards of fresh, untouched snow. From the looks of it, something had frightened Landy, causing her to break off from the path and into the field. But what could have scared her so badly and where had she gone? Certainly it couldn't have been a wild animal. There were no blood and no tracks anywhere around. Could a person have abducted her? Again, the snow offered no answers. The search continued well into the next day, but everybody was left scratching their heads. Landy Junkins had simply vanished off the face of the earth. Now, several days later, tragedy of a lesser sort would befall Hans Hedrick on his farm around 11 miles north. Hardrick was keeping his sheep in a crude shelter, just as he did every winter protecting them both from predator and from the elements. One morning in early February, he and his wife set out to town, securely locking their cabin while they were away. When the Hardricks returned home, Hans set about feeding the sheep for the night. He opened the shed door. To his surprise, one of the flock was absent. The remaining sheep were acting skittish, cowering together in a corner. Across the floor lay scraps of wood. Hans picked up some of the debris to examine it, his eyes drifting up to the ceiling. Now, there was a hole in the roof. While the structure was by no means the sturdiest, someone had enough strength to punch a hole in the wood. Looking closer, he could see telltale signs of a struggle. Bits of wool still clung to the edge of the hole. It was here that the missing sheep had been taken. Furious! He stormed out of the shed, intent on tracking whoever did this. Hans made it two steps out of the door before he stops in his tracks. The only footprints in the snow leading to the sheep shed were his own. A cold dread, colder than any West Virginia winter, crept down his very spine as he surveyed the exterior of the building. There were no more footprints, nothing. Whatever had taken his sheep had landed on the roof, punched a hole in it, and dragged at least a hundred pounds of mutton through the top. The only thing Hans could do was repair the roof. For extra security, he decorated the interior with crude crosses, hoping to ward off whatever supernatural presence had now violated his livestock. The first good description of the creature responsible for these disappearances was finally obtained after it appeared to County Deputy Sheriff Rube Nyheiser, who spotted it while hunting near Owlhead Mountain with his son on February 7th. The pair had been following deer tracks through the laurel when they stumbled out of the forest and into a clearing. They were immediately met with ear-piercing screams. Looking in the direction of the sound, they saw the deer they had been tracking, a doe and her fawn under siege by a massive eagle circling overhead. The raptor dive-bombed its terrified prey several times before successfully snatching the youngster in its talons and then effortlessly carrying it over the treetops. 
Nyheiser fired a shot as the beast soared away, but missed. The doe, badly wounded in an attempt to save her offspring, met her end when Nyheiser slit her throat with his hunting knife. It was a mercy kill. According to Nyheiser and his son, the eagle's white wings must have measured 15 to 18 feet tip to tip. Its body was the size of a full-grown man and covered in dark brown feathers. But most unsettling were its eyes. According to the newspaper report of the incident, its eyes were tremendous, larger than those of the largest size owl, and they shone with terrible brilliancy, plainly discernible from where he stood and watched. Despite the fact that the gigantic bird had finally been seen, it had not yet been witnessed attacking human beings. Its connection to Landy Junkin's disappearance remained speculative. All that changed, however, on February 12th. Peter Swadley was bear hunting with his dog, Gunner, along the Laurel Creek when he came to a small clearing on the mountainside. Without warning, something heavy fell upon him, issuing a blood-curdling scream. His first thought that it was a mountain lion, but within moments, he realized it was actually an immense bird. Twice, he felt himself lifted off his feet, but fell back to the ground each time. Massive talons dug into his back, stripping his coat to rags as he fumbled for his hunting knife. He barely managed to grip the handle before the raptor slashed above his left eye, gouging three inches of his scalp alone. Now, nearly blinded by the blood dripping into his eye, Swale swung the knife, but his attacker never relented. At last, he shouted for Gunner, who had strayed from his side moments before the attack. The dog came to his aid, coursing through the snow to help its master. The dog lunged at the massive bird. The creature shifted its attention from Swadley to now his pet. And with one deft motion of its talons, it pierced into Gunner's side, opening his belly wide. Swadley wiped the blood from his eyes just in time to see his attacker depart into the cold West Virginia sky, his friend now gone, clutched in its claws. Swadley managed to stumble his way down the mountainside to the cabin of a kind old man who dressed his wounds and rode him into town for further medical attention. Swadley wasn't able to offer a satisfying description of the animal, but was certain that it had been a gigantic bird, and that he had much rather it been a mountain lion as he initially expected. Over the coming weeks, the monster eagle would be seen here and there by residents in the vicinity of Addison and Burgu. Farmers kept watch over their herds and flocks for fear they might fall victim to this same bird. Parents watched children out of the corners of their eyes and enforced an early and strict curfew for fear they might meet the same fate as little Landy Junkins. Eventually, one of the old mountaineers, Pap Tamman, told newspapers that this had not been the first incursion of terrifying birds into the holler. He remembered a time many years ago when a pair of raptors had moved in, harassing the populace and stealing livestock, only to melt away with the spring thaw. Eventually, the Thunderbird of Burgu did as well. Pap Tamman's tales wouldn't have seemed so surprising to North America's original inhabitants. Indigenous tribes throughout the continent spoke of thunderbirds, gigantic avian beings with supernatural powers. Their strength was legendary. Their wings caused peals of thunder, their eyes lightning bolts to lance downward upon the landscape. Most indigenous art depicts them as closely resembling real-world raptors like eagles, hawks, and falcons. Although perhaps most prominently celebrated in the PNW, Pacific Northwest, Native American tribes in the Southwest, along the East Coast, and throughout the Great Lakes and Great Plains regions all spoke of the same thing. Thunderbirds. Oftentimes they were righteous figures, charged with ruling the higher levels of existence and even punishing mortals who violated cultural taboos. This divine role sometimes placed the Thunderbirds at odds with creatures of the underworld. 
In Algonquin mythology, for example, the Thunderbird used its lightning to smote creatures sent into our realm by the ruler of the lower world, a figure known either as the Underwater Panther or the Great Horn Spirit. The Ojibwe believed that the Thunderbird's mastery over the elements allowed them to control the weather and would leave offerings to protect their people from storms. For the Lakota tribe, Thunderbirds orchestrated this weather from a land far to the west beyond the setting sun. The Ho-Chunk called upon Thunderbirds to assure victory whenever marching into battle. Thunderbirds were not always benevolent, however. Depending on tribal belief, a casual indifference for human life sometimes accompanied their position above the rest of the natural world. This interpretation seemed especially common among tribes residing along the western coast of Canada and southern Alaska. Numerous Inuit tales describe the birds snatching up reindeer and helpless human beings for their dinner. In one tale, a brave young hunter tracked his missing wife to the Thunderbird's Airy. Upon finding her remains, he exacted his revenge by slaughtering the Thunderbird's offspring. Then, lying in wait to slay the beast with his bow and arrow when it returned to the nest. He failed, however, and the bird, while wounded, simply escaped northward, where they live in the frozen wastes to this day. Some Thunderbirds hunted even larger prey. In 1904, ethnographer James Swanton collected Thunderbird tales from the Tlingit tribe, writing this, The Thunderbird causes thunder by flapping its wings or by moving a single quill. When it winks, lightning flashes. Upon its back is a large lake, which accounts for the great quantity of rain falling during a thunder shower. The Thunderbird keeps on thundering and the sky continues cloudy until the bird catches a whale. Then it carries the whale up into the mountains, where bones of whales caught in this manner may often be seen. A native hunter was once overtaken by a thunderstorm and was blinded by a great flash. When he finally looked up and saw a big Thunderbird astride a mountain, it had the general appearance of an eagle and another time, some Sitka people out in a choppy place in the ocean heard thundering going on in a certain direction and, repairing to that point next day, found a whale lodged in the trees with claw marks on it. A Russian vessel was almost carried away by one of these birds because the sailor had made fun of it. Colossal birds of staggering strength and size are in a variety of ancient cosmologies. The ability of Thunderbirds to fly away with whales reminds one of the Roc, a terrifying raptor which features prominently in many Middle Eastern tales. According to legend, the Roc is so immense that when it flies, it resembles a mountain suspended in midair. It dines upon elephants, which are no larger to the Roc than rabbits are to a real eagle. In fact, in the 13th century, the famed explorer Marco Polo reported the Roc as a factual creature, stating this, It was for all the world like an eagle, but one indeed of enormous size, so big in fact that its quills were 12 paces long and thick in proportion, and it is so strong that it will seize an elephant in its talons and carry him high into the air and drop him so that he is smashed to pieces. Having so killed him, the bird swoops down on him and eats him at leisure. The rock may itself derive from even older Hindu stories where the bird deity known as Garuda finds himself locked in mortal combat with the underworld serpent Naga. Like the rock, Garuda is depicted in various religious texts as being large enough to carry off elephants. All these myths from so many different cultures beg the question as to whether or not they were based upon actual creatures. I mean, did people see massive birds in the sky, perhaps surviving relics of a species thought to be extinct and fashion fantastic legends around them? If so, could some of these specimens have endured into the modern era? While rarely of monstrous size, the historical record is littered 
I mean, with plenty of accounts where human beings, infants, and children most often have been apprehended by oversized raptors. It is not a common occurrence, and few of the attackers are successful, but it has happened. Accounts where adolescents or adults are abducted are much more rare, but still appear in regional folklore and urban legends. According to a May 1963 Saga Magazine article by Jack Pearl, a Japanese-American intermittent camp in California was plagued by attacks from a massive bird which flew off with several prisoners. Pearl wrote this, One of the most eerie Thunderbird incidents occurred in 1944 in a California intermittent camp where Americans of Japanese origin were held during World War II. Over a period of months, more than half a dozen internees disappeared from this camp, and it was thought they had escaped. In the course of thorough investigation that followed, to figure out how this group of people had escaped and who had helped them, the only thing investigators could get out of the internees was that a giant bird had carried off the missing men. The angry soldiers assumed that they were being taken or pranked by the Japanese Americans who had been fraternizing with local natives working around the camp. These natives habitually told wild stories about a monster bird that lurked in the lofty mountain peaks. The opinion was reinforced when two of the natives rushed into camp one morning shouting excitedly that they had seen a Thunderbird kill and carry off a man the night before. After tightening security at the camp, the disappearances stopped. But Pearl offered a chilling coda to his far-fetched story, writing that, Usually, when Japanese-American internees escaped from the camps, they would be picked up again in days or weeks, while trying to sneak in or out of the homes of friends or mingling self-consciously in Chinese sections. It rarely worked. Strangely, None of the internees who escaped from the camp ever turned up again, during the war or after. They had literally and figuratively disappeared into thin air, so claimed their fellow inmates and the natives. Thankfully, people who encounter truly colossal birds today, and there are hundreds of eyewitnesses, rarely describe them as overly aggressive. This doesn't mean that they aren't still intimidating, however. An especially dramatic encounter unfolded circa summer 2008 in Ohio. The witness en route from Mount Vernon to Martinsburg on State Route 586 was rounding a sharp wooded curve mere miles from her departure point when she saw something in the middle of the road. Even though she was a half mile from the creature, she could tell that it was an enormous bird, the largest she had ever seen. Even though it was like an eagle, her immediate thought was the creature had the regal bearing of a dragon. Its wings stretched out over both sides of the roads. The creature was hovering in midair by the right-hand side, flapping its enormous dark wings to stay aloft. She watched it for nearly 10 seconds as her car approached before it dipped down, disappearing in the forest. The entire affair almost seemed to uh, play out in slow motion. By the time the witness reached the spot where it had been, there was no sign of the creature. And why would there be? Large birds had harassed residents of Illinois throughout July and August of 1977. The creature's wings made sounds compared to jet engines. They attacked livestock and issued primordial cries whenever they were confronted. One of the best Illinois sightings came from the Chappelles, a farming family near Odin who watched one of the birds for a full 10 minutes. Around 7 a.m. on August 11th, one of the birds circled their pond before finally finding a tree limb big enough to support its massive size. The tree visibly bent under the weight and the animal's wings stretched about 14 feet long while its body seemed to be about four to six feet tall. It resembled a gigantic vulture with a long S-shaped neck and charcoal gray feathers. As it sat in the tree, it eventually took off headed southwest. Pennsylvania is one of the states with the richest history of Thunderbird sightings. Many have unfolded in the black forest region in the northern portion of the state. For example, Robert Lyman, Sr., had a sighting right near Cloudersport. 
For example, author Robert Lyman Sr. had a sighting right near Cowdersport in the 1940s of a creature with a 20-foot wingspan. Can you imagine? Judging from the width of the road, like in the Ohio case from 2008, the enormous bird flew not above, but into the forest, begging the question how such a massive animal can navigate the dense trees within. Since that day, Lyman has made it a passion project to collect as many Thunderbird sightings as he possibly can from northern Pennsylvania. He has amassed dozens over the course of his career. Interestingly, eight adults and three children have disappeared over the last century in the Black Forest region alone, each without a trace. Could these massive birds be to blame? In March of 1973, Joseph and Wanda Kay were traveling in their car through the Black Forest when they happened upon something standing in the road as well. Neither husband nor wife could identify it until they drew closer. They saw it was an immense bird, similar to a bald eagle but entirely black. The creature approached them, trying to achieve liftoff, and it seemed to be having some difficulty getting it, it into the air. According to Wanda, it stood tall enough to look in her passenger side window. With great effort, the bird slowly pumped its heavy wings, one of which brushed the couple's windshield, and unlike other Thunderbirds, this specimen chose to soar over rather than through the forest. The difficulty with which the K's Thunderbird took to the air appears in other sightings from time to time. For example, in the summer of 1978, Jesse Ross saw what he described as a prehistoric eagle sitting on a large rock somewhere east of Arco, Idaho. It was entirely black, except for its head, which he described it as a bright orange with a hooked beak. He approached the bird, which tried to fly away, but seemed to exhibit some difficulty in doing so. It began with a waddle and then finally hopped into the sky and caught the warm summer thermals, unfurling its wingspan, which appeared to be around 22 feet long. The Cherokee of America's Southeast exhibited a relationship of fearful respect with their Thunderbirds, known as the Delanua. The Delanua were known for regularly snatching dogs and young children from their villages. In one tale, a hunter taken to a Delanoa nest was able to escape only by strapping himself to one of the massive eagles, which carried him safely back to the ground. The relationship between southeastern tribes and their thunderbirds can even be seen encoded on the landscape today. If the myths are to be believed, scattered across the Appalachian Mountains are a series of grassy mountaintops known as balds. These summits sport sparse vegetation, nothing more than thick grasses and shrubbery, instead of the heavy growth of forest one would expect. According to some Cherokee lore, the Balds were once home to Thunderbird Ares. Sometime in the distant past, their ancestors, tired of defending themselves against the Thunderbird's predations, took to the mountaintops and burned the gigantic nests, leaving the Balds devoid of trees. The balds were then utilized as lookout stations to protect against further Thunderbird incursions. A good example of a bald mountain is Brasstown Bald, the highest point in the state of Georgia. Georgia has seen its share of Thunderbird sightings over the decades as well. One evening in June of 1994, a couple driving near Hogansville spotted a gigantic crow black bird with a 10-foot wingspan as it glided across the road. Had it landed, it would have stood an estimated three and a half feet tall. In March of 2016, a remote control airplane hobbyist near Adairsville nearly collided his model aircraft with a bird several times its size, a wingspan of over eight feet. It had a long neck and a pointed beak. At one point in the 1800s even, rumors had circulated that an eagle large enough to carry off pigs and children once harassed the skies of Winder, a small town in the northeast portion of the state. According to the reports, the bones of a child's foot were discovered in its nest 15 miles north near Price Mountain. 
and in recent years, another Winder resident may have seen one of these creatures herself, not once, but twice. Sandra Paradise is a Georgian native, born and raised in Atlanta. By 2008, she had moved well out of the big city to Winder. Her place of work was in Athens, home to the University of Georgia and about a half an hour east of Winder. Each morning, Sandra would hop in her Toyota Camry and drive 25 miles, mostly along Highway 82. The two-lane route was a pleasant one, taking her through North Georgia woodlands interspersed with farmers' pastures here and there. Sandra awoke early on the morning of August 27, 2008. For whatever reason, she was unable to return to sleep, so she decided to go into work a little bit early and beat whatever traffic might have been on the road. If she was lucky, she might even be able to leave work a little bit early that day too. Sandra pulled out of her driveway around 6.45 in the morning. The day was overcast, the sun hiding behind a veil of clouds that had made their way up from the coast, remnants of the aftermath of a tropical storm fay, afforded her excellent viewing conditions for her sighting. As there was enough light to see by, but not enough to blind her as she drove towards the rising sun. 10 miles and 15 minutes into her commute, Sander rounded a slight downhill curve into one of Highway 82's forested patches. Steep wooded embankments flanked either side of the road on this two-lane road. And from the right-hand side, something caught her eye. It was an animal flying out of the tree line directly in front of her vehicle. Sandra caught a good look at this shape from the underside as it soared right across the road. It seemed about as long as her car was wide. Its color reminded Sandra of the deer she would often see on her commute, a sort of light brown tan color with thin dark horizontal bands crisscrossing its belly. A pair of wings, half unfurled, propelled it as it made a dive bombing motion through the air and to the trees on the opposite roadside. However, the most peculiar aspects of the creature could be found on either end. It sported a long, thin tail, which terminated in a distinctive heart-shaped pad made of thick flesh. On the opposite end sat a curved, hammer-shaped head, complete with a crest jutting from the back. Sandra was adamant that the crest was solid and not feathery. She barely caught dark spots indicating the placement of eyes. Its mouth was firmly closed shut. Even though she was alone, Sandra found herself exclaiming, What is that? in her empty car. I was floored, she remembered later. I knew what it was. I couldn't believe what it was, but I knew what it was. Sandra quickly grabbed her cell phone to dial the number of a friend she knew would be awake, just so she would have someone to share her experience with. She tripped over her, her words as she described the creature and where she had seen it. Simply put, it had looked like a pterosaur. Her friend scoffed at the idea. He offered that what she had actually seen was a great blue heron. The tail must have been a snake that it had in its beak. Part of me was thinking, well, sure, of course, she later wrote. Something like that was what it was. It couldn't be what it looked like. It couldn't be. And the other part of me was thinking, you know damn well what it was. And then I looked at the link he sent and googled some herons flying. Whatever it might be, a great blue heron ain't it. The color's wrong, shape is wrong, it's all wrong. This, however, was not the last time that Sandra Paradise would see a pterosaur in the skies above Winder. Because, on September 10th, Sandra overslept and was running late for work. She did not leave home until 8.50 in the morning, and even though weather conditions were similar to those on her first sighting, the only thing on her mind was getting to Athens. This time, she was even closer to home, a mere two miles away when she saw this same creature, or another member of its species, just outside the Winder city limits. Although it was further away this time, it shared the exact same profile and seemed much larger than the first specimen, about as long as her car hood to trunk. It was flapping through the air perpendicular to her route, which makes me believe was the first one she saw a baby or a youngling.
Was this an older version of the same species? Hmm. Sandra studied the creature more carefully this time and made certain that it wasn't a great blue heron carrying a snake. No, the head crest and long flowing tail, complete with the heart-shaped pad, were just as she had remembered. This wasn't a great blue heron. Sandra's second sighting took place at the crest of a hill. The creature was soaring across the treetops about roughly 120 yards away. Given her vantage point, the canopy was not as high in the sky as it would have been had she been on the ground. She lost sight of the creature as she came downhill. Most people are terrified when they see strange things in the sky. Sandra Paradise, on the other hand, was thrilled by her encounter. You don't have to go to some exotic places like New Guinea. As far as I can tell, you can sit on a hill outside the town where I live in the mornings and see them. Tomorrow, I get to drive a commute I used to hate and dread. The world is now totally different. I feel blessed that God has allowed me to see this creature and should not be here, and yet it is this strange dragon-like thing that lives somewhere in the woods in this redneck little town. Fortunately, Sandra is a trained artist and was able to sketch the creatures from her sightings for researchers. The drawings look remarkably like pterosaurs. Two aspects of Sandra Paradise's sighting are worth mentioning. First, the overcast naturally puts one in the mindset of Native American Thunderbird legends, where the creatures were associated with clouds and inclement weather. The second feature, more interesting from a paleontologist perspective, is the heart-shaped pad that the creatures displayed. This feature has appeared in other pterosaur sightings over the years. For example, in 2013, a Danville, Illinois witness saw a gray crest-headed pterodactyl soar above Vermilion River, complete with a tail that terminated in a flattened pad. Six years later, another witness in Wheaton saw a similar creature describing its tail as ending in a spade shape. The detail of the heart or spade-shaped tail pad finds corroboration in the fossil record. A subspecies of pterosaurs, known as Ramphorhynchoids, not only possessed tails, but their tails ended in distinctive shapes resembling flattened spades or leaves. Judging from the remains recovered by paleontologists, these creatures began life with a spear-shaped appendage before developing into a diamond or kite shape, then a triangle at an advanced age. Depending upon when in the creature's life cycle it was observed, Beasts like the ones seen by Sandra Paradise and the Illinois Witnesses may have represented a surviving member of this subspecies. Could a surviving population of pterosaurs be at least partially responsible for Thunderbird myths and contemporary sightings of gigantic birds? Is it true that some species have reached monstrous proportions? The largest and most famous was the Quetzalcoatlus, a pterosaur which stood as tall as a giraffe and displayed an intimidating wingspan of nearly 40 feet. 40 feet. Since Quetzalcoatlus died out 100 million years ago, others suspect Thunderbird myths might be blamed on a more recent species, a type of raptor specifically known as a pteratorn, a species closely related to modern vultures once patrolled our very skies. While not as large as the Thunderbirds of myth, the largest pteratorns still boasted an impressive wingspan of well over 20 feet, making it one of the largest flying birds to have ever existed. Hear the dogs barking out there right now? They're seeing a Thunderbird right this very second. It's out there. That They're barking at it. What's more is pteratorn species persisted until the late Pleistocene era which ended around the 11,700 years ago mark, meaning it coexisted alongside Homo sapiens. Even more recently, our ancestors had to contend with predators like New Zealand's Hast Eagle, which only died out some 600 years ago. The Hast Eagle was the largest eagle to have ever existed and had a wingspan of up to 10 feet. Even though believed extinct by the scientific community, the Hast Eagle may have survived in the myths of the Maori, who tell of large eagles capable of killing human beings. Since even smaller species like golden eagles are capable of killing small deer and bear cubs, 
Could an even larger bird have carried off infants and young children? Could birds like the Hast Eagle have inspired Thunderbird myths? And could some similar species exist to this very day? Even if rarely seen. I mean, skeptics naturally ask what evidence we have for the existence of Thunderbirds just beyond eyewitness testimony. Rumors circulate where people swear to have seen the remains of monstrous birds, but so far, no specimens have ever been made available to the scientific community. While a few photographs have circulated over the years, most pictures of carcasses have been deemed hoaxes. For decades now, cryptozoologists whispered about a photo from the 1800s featuring cowboys posing alongside a massive bird nailed to the wall of a barn. Plenty of people claim to have seen it, but the real photograph never surfaced. To make matters worse, this photograph had been restaged dozens of times, flooding the internet with a slew of photos which appear authentic at first, but are invariably proven to be hoaxes. Genuine videos and photos of living specimens are easier to come by, but most run into a basic problem of scale. Unless you know the position and distance of an object in the sky or have another aerial object or feature to which it can be compared, it is practically impossible to verify its size. And as I'm talking about this topic, I'm sure you could hear my dogs in the background because there is a Thunderbird circling directly overhead and it is freaking them out. Many earnest eyewitnesses have their evidence discounted as footage of a known species. So do strange creatures still terrorize our skies? It's certainly terrorizing my backyard. No one could say for certain, but the next time you find yourself outside and become irrationally terrified for no good reason, consider looking up. But more importantly, what do you guys think? Is there any truth at all to all the native legends and the legends of ancient cultures and modern sightings of the so-called Thunderbird? Or are they all just hallucinations or misidentifications or just made up stories? Is there truly a Thunderbird in my backyard circling causing my dogs to freak out? Let me know what you think in the comments below. I want to hear from you. And of course, if you're new to the channel and enjoy what you watch today, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more content pretty close to this. And as always, I love you all. Keep an open mind. I'll check you guys out in the very next episode.